Welcome everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce Sheila Prebright. Sheila Prebright is an acclaimed international phot photographic artist who creates large scale works that combine a wide range of knowledge of contemporary culture. Um, she is known for her series hashtag 1960 now, which is currently being exhibited outside of the FADS building, um, Young Americans, Plastic Bodies, and Suburbia. Bright is also the author of hashtag 1960s now, um, photographs of civil rights activists and Black Lives Matter protest and is published by Chronicle Book. Um, the work has been featured in the New York Times and she has appeared in 2014 through the lens darkly, Black photographers and the emergence of a people. And the 2016 feature length documentary film Election Day, Lens Across America. Her series has also been exhibited at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History in Washington, D.C., the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland, Ohio, the Art Gallery of Hamilton in Ontario, Canada, Turner Contemporary in the United Kingdom, and the Leica Gallery in New York. Her series of works have been reviewed and written about nationally and internationally. Bright is the recipient of several nominations and awards as well. Recently, she's been awarded the Commission for Picturing the South by the High Museum of Art in Atlanta and a Boston University Commission of a Multimedia Installation entitled Rebirth. And her work is included in numerous private and public collections, such as the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Library of Congress, National Center for Civil and Human Rights, and here at our very own Nerman Museum. So please give a warm welcome to Sheila Prebright. Hi, thanks, um, everyone. Um, I want to thank the Norman Museum of Contemporary Art um, for having me. And thank you, Tony, for the introduction. And I want to start off because I know we only have 20 minutes to talk about a little bit about myself and how I became an artist, you know, photographer. Um, actually, this image that you see before you is my father. Um, he was in the military and I'm a daughter of a soldier. And we traveled every three or four years. And I believe that reflecting back now, since, the, since we've been in the house in pandemic, um, my formative years, I grew up in Germany and I was very young up into the age of seven years old. And my father kept us in museums and I was a lover of books and very shy and very introverted. And it wasn't until we, um, a lot of us kids on the base, we would go over to Germantown um, and we were just having fun and the German kids call us a nigger. And that's what I think really prompts me with my work because ever since then, I was curious about why different ethnic groups would look upon others in a different way. I didn't understand that as a child and I actually didn't want to be black. So this photograph that you see before you is a recent photograph that I took when I was, this is in Atlanta, Georgia, in the urban areas. And what really struck my attention was the crown of that symbolism of Basquiat and it says Lonnie's Hood. And I immediately went out, got out of the car, took the photograph and start engaging people in the community and ask them, who is Lonnie? And they um, proceeded to tell me Lonnie was like a king in our neighborhood. He's the one that took care of us. But how he took care of them, care of, uh, of them was through um, selling drugs. And if you think about in the, I believe in the 70s and 80s, that was like the crack era, of, I don't know, crack era. And that was around the time in the 90s for me, I graduated from college in the 90s and I decided to go to Houston, Texas. And at that time, that it was gangster rap. I really had an interest, interest, interest in hip hop culture and I did not go to school for photography at all. I just took it upon myself. Um, I had one camera, it was filmed back then, and I took portraits of hip hop artists. And I did not know, I didn't really know the culture. And so I was told to come over to a house 
and to photograph for a CD cover. And all these young black males were there and they all came out with their guns and the young men that you see with, it's like in prayer. Um, I took their photograph and I asked them, I said, are those real guns? And they said, yes. They said, where you come from? You're like a white girl in a black body. So that's my introduction into photography as self-taught. And I'm gonna just go through these real quick, quick. And my first show was in Houston, Texas with these images, these portraits that I had taken. taken. And that's how I became interested in the art world because actually an artist friend of mine um, came over and came over to my studio and saw these portraits that I was taking of, of hip hop. And he says, you need to be in a show. So my first show was in Houston, Texas with three other women that had their MFAs. And that's what started my career in, in, in photography. And moving forward, um, I left Houston, Texas, heading up to California, but didn't make it to California. I end up in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> and I've been here ever since. And my father is the one that told me when I was young that I was going to do something creative, but he didn't know what it was. And so parents retired. They came to the South. I did not grow up in the South. I wasn't even raised in the South, but I, my parents are from the South. And so when I came to Atlanta, my father saw my work that I was photographing and he actually told me, he says, you need to go to school. So that's when I went to school and received my MFA in photography. And it really opened up a big world for me because it made me understand how to really think about, I, I start looking at history more. And I did not realize how black bodies were really political and how it was viewed in, in the culture and pop culture or even in history. So when I was in school, I got out of school. I'm going to be going back and forth, back to school, and back and forth. I created a body of work called Suburbia because I'm really inter interested in lives of those individuals and communities that are often unseen in the world and who are unheard as they contemplate, contemplate their voices, voices and their reaction to ideas and issues that are shaping their world. So I create like contemporary stories about social political, historical content, not seen, you know, really in visual communication or in the art world. So I created this body of work when I got out of grad school called Suburbia because I really wanted to talk about and challenge the narratives about African Americans because uh, what we see in the media a lot is the urban communities. And we don't, all, I believe that in, what I'm trying to say is that the middle class African Americans is the invisibility of, of them. So I've called this body of work suburbia. I will go into the homes and I will photograph, but you will never see, you might see like this woman, she's laying in bed, but she's reading Business Week, the future of technology. And I'm just going to go through this real fast. And the last image you see, Norm, um, the Nerman Museum actually um, collected this in their collection. And it's images of Obama when he won, President Obama um, won, won the office. And this body of work actually um, made me nationally. So I had to go up to, I won the Santa Fe Prize 2006. Um, it's called Santa Fe now. And I had to speak, even though I won this award, I had to speak to publishers, editors, um, consultants, curators about my work. And one common theme that they all had was that I did not have enough signifiers in the work to show that these were black homes. And that was the whole point of this body of work. I was told, well, we've never heard of your suburbia. Why didn't you call, call it black suburbia? And I was like, I, I, I really had a headache. I got a headache talking to all of them. And when I had to speak that Sunday, Sunday to everybody, it just made me realize that how we live in the 21st century and how these narratives 
of, of, of Western thought is really ingrained in our unconsciousness and we don't even realize it. I, I think some of us don't even realize that, um, that we are doing that because we're still trying to look for these narratives. So for me as a black woman, what I tend to want to do with my work, I want to decolonize the camera through a black woman. And I want you to see, I want you to see and feel a different way of looking, reading imagery. And so um, this body of work, I'm gonna just go through my bodies of work. Um, it's called Plastic Bodies. And I was talking about women of color and what is the ideal concept of beauty in Western culture. And I started looking at the Barbie doll because the Barbie doll in Western cult culture, everybody's played with a Barbie doll and it's a symbolism globally across the world. So I started morphing dolls and dolls and women together to show a thin line between reality and, and non-reality. It's a Barbie doll with that. And what I would like to say about this work, I, I do believe that I try to find the universal commonality amongst all people, even though you see the imagery, you see that these are women of color, but I feel that in order for us to move forward is that we don't have to do anything, but in order for us to move forward, I do believe that we should try to seek and find um, universal commonality amongst all of us. And this body of work is called Young Americans. And at the time, this work was produced in 2006 to 2008. I really, with all of my work, it may visually look different, but there's a common thread and theme through my work. In this body of work, I was looking at young people because I was really thinking about they would be the next ones to run this country. And I really wanted to know how they thought about America. So I traveled across the country and I gave it to Generation Y because they're the largest generation in history. And I photographed the sitters from 18 to 25 years old, because I do believe at 18, you start developing your own ideas and thoughts, you're coming out of your parents' home. And this body of work was my first solo show at the High Museum of Art, and I received a major grant from the Aetna Foundation from this. And when I photographed this, it was really interesting to see different ethnic groups, how they felt about the flag. But one common thread that they all have, no matter what, what, it, what still remains are the stars and stripes. And they are the young people that's going to have the burden to really um, deal with this country. That's Phoebe. So in 2013, I was in my studio um, photographing um, the elders that were from the civil rights movement because Trayvon Martin happened. And I started thinking about young people again. And I said, wow, I said, it's really going to take young people in order to um, bring about change. And so I started thinking about, like I said, the elders in the movement that were unknown. And this image is not mine. It was um, photographed in 1963. And you see women, you see um, dirt girls, you see mothers, you see aunts. And they're coming from, from the church um, in Birmingham where the four year little girls were um, bombed bomb and I thought about my parents because they are from this generation they were young people they were 18 17 years old and they had to they had to grow up during Jim Crow era and, and, I, and I think about imagining their trauma but what is happening now is that since Trayvon and black bodies are continue to be looked upon 
as negativity and being shot being shot by police brutality is that what has changed the young people says we're fighting the same fights that our parents are fighting and this is a um, self-portrait of me where i started this body of work and i call it 1960 now and this is mr lonnie king one of the elders that i was shooting in my studio at the time and one thing that I learned from the elders from the civil rights movement, there's a lot that I did not know. What we learn in the history of the books, we're gonna to have to rethink that and how we learn. And Mr. King, I wanna read this. He said, it took imagination, creativity, and suffering by African-Americans in order for them to be marginally under the umbrella of freedom. He started the Atlanta student movement back in the 1960s with, within the black colleges. And they did not want him to do this, but they said that we're sick and tired of being sick and tired, just like the young people today are saying, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And these are young people back then. This is Dr. Rosalind Pope, who authored the Pill of Human Rights. She went to Spelman and she was 19 years old when she um, wrote, authored that. So I started thinking that I needed to go to the ground to find out who the young visionaries are. And I did, and the hashtag Black Lives Matter was actually created by three um, women, Black women from the LBGT community, and they wanted to send a love letter out to Black folks to uplift them. It's just like what James Brown say it loud. I don't know. He's back in the 60s. I don't know if uh, you guys know about him, but he made a song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. All he was trying to do was uplift Black folks. And the same thing that the young women decided to do with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. That's what they wanted to do. And it's different back then because it was put on social media. It wasn't meant for everybody. It was meant for African-Americans. And this image that you see before you is um, um, Mickey B. And he's from the movements. This is Bree Newson who took down the Confederate flag. So I'm gonna go through these real quick. And also while I was in the studio, I felt that I needed to go to the ground to find out really what was going on. And I got received a call, I think this was in 2016, um, in Atlanta, they always have the Martin Luther King parade. And the young people said, she we getting ready to shut it down. It's about reclaiming, hashtag reclaim Martin Luther King. And they shut the parade down. The elders were so upset with them and told them that Martin Luther King would be upset with you. And they said, no, he will not. He wouldn't because he was about resistant. And they were tired of the commercialization of Martin Luther King because Martin Luther King was about resistance. And so I traveled from, I started in Atlanta, Baltimore, I was in Ferguson, I was um, in Baton Rouge, Washington, DC. And this is one of the images, Speak No Evil, that I shot in Atlanta. Let me go through those real quick. And what I pay attention a lot within my work and how I shoot on, on the ground is I'm really interested in a lot of signs. We are not disposable. I purposely shot in black and white. And when I photograph, I'm waiting for moments. I'm not clicking on the shutter of my camera, hoping that I get a shot. I'm waiting for that moment. And then I click the shutter on my camera. And I look at all of these, because if you notice that I shoot very tight, these are portraits to me, because that's, that's where I, I, I come from, is, is portraiture work. And I'm trying to show, even though these are protest images, I'm trying to sh um, have you feel or see a little bit different from what the images that you see in the media. You see a black male here and he has tears coming down his face. It's very emotional. This is J Janae Monet, and she had the song, Hell What You Talking About. 
say her name and this was taken in Atlanta. And it, what I was about to say, you can't help, and even for me as an artist, it's very emotional being on the ground. It's, I, I see the pain, I, I saw the hurt. It, it, it's very, very emotional. And this image right here, it looks like it is a portrait. And this woman actually was holding up a liberation flag and standing on American flag. But what I wanted to show you was the pain that the sorrow that she had in her eyes. Sister in Ferguson, Baltimore. And one thing about um, BL Black Lives Matter, when it first started off, the young people were very organized, even though people did not think that they were organized. They were very organized. They were very creative when they went out in the streets, when they first did the die-ins. Their whole purpose was to stop the traffic, to make individuals to feel uncomfortable. It was very unapologetic. This is a silence march for um, Freddie Gray. And I love this. We love our people and we will be here until justice is served. This was taken in Ferguson. And also being on the ground is very tense. It's, it's very, very tense on the ground. And when you see the flag upside down, it's, in, it's very in distress. So now we're in the pandemic and George Floyd happened. This really, I mean, all of the work that I've done and all of the killings really put me in a sunken place. But when I saw what happened on TV with George Floyd and the whole world globally saw this image and he called out his, he called out mother, calling out for his mother. I was like, this, this has to stop. When is it gonna stop? And this image actually I, I took for um, change.org here in Atlanta, they created a hologram where the first time in Atlanta, they took down a Confederate monument. And this is where this is. And they projected George Floyd image over, over well, the monument's not there, but this is the courthouse. And he was supposed to be a symbolism of change. But what happened? We still continued to have deaths. And this is Rayshard in Atlanta. He was killed at Wendy's, Wendy's in Atlanta, Georgia. And my interest too, I just, I have an interest in photographing the protest, but I'm trying to look for different things within the protest. These are mothers in Atlanta who are speaking upon how their children had died from, were killed by police in Atlanta, along with um, state representatives of them. They're pat trying to pass a bill. And so I go to places like that. These are black men that are suited up in suits and they march from the historical Martin Luther King church to his house and wanted to show they wanted to do something. They were in suburbia. These are the recent images I shot after George Floyd. This is one of the Congresswomen, Stop Killing Us. We always matter. And this image right here is, there was about 10 or 15 um, black women that went to Kentucky to march for a hundred days fighting for Breonna Taylor. And when the verdict came back and it didn't go like usual, the way that everybody wanted to go, and they didn't do anything with the police officers, they held a rally here in Atlanta, um, an organization called the People Uprising, Young People. And they focus on Brianna. It's like, we must protect black women. Martha Luther King, not Martha Luther King, Mal Malcolm X stated that the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. And so they wanted to do a rally, a memorial or around that. And it was very emotional with that. And I focused on the women that were there. Black women matter. And I'm gonna, this is 
one of my current work that I started shooting last year because ever since 2013, I've been photographing the movement and I've been thinking about how I, as an image maker, make work be make work that really elevates because I have a book out. I've been traveling internationally, nationally so. And when George Floyd happened, I was like, what am I doing? Do anybody care? We're, we're repeating history. And how can, I, I know I can't change everybody, but I feel that my art can be used as a form of activism to bring awareness. And so I was approached by the photo editor from the Washington Post and they commissioned out 10 photographers to, 10 photographers, they wanted us to talk about racism. I'm like, okay, I'll talk about racism, but I don't want to show bodies. Because I think when you see the bodies, we're we are caught up as a, in humanity with our own ideologies. And it's hard for us to change. We say we want change, but I don't know if we really do because I don't, that's not what we're manifesting. So I live about 10 minutes away from Stone Mountain in Atlanta. And Stone Mountain back in the 1950 is one of the largest granites in the country and the, um, Daughters of the Confederate daughters of the of the, of the soldiers, um, Confederate daughters of the Confederacy. I'm sorry, of the Confederacy, they wanted to build memorials, and at this park, they actually carved in three Confederate generals into a carving, and the park is so beautiful, and they still have the Confederate flags, slave homes there, and you have over four million or four billion people that visit this park every year, and I didn't know if they really understood the history and the rootness of where racism came from. W. Du Bois talked about how I call this body of work Invisible Empire. He talked about how Georgia is so beautiful, but so disturbing. And this is, I wanted to photograph and challenge myself with landscapes. And this is the granite that you see. And the second coming of the KKK in 1950 went to Stone Mountain and they burned a cross, had a Bible, wrote, um, read Romans chapter 12. This is my father's Bible, actually. And when I placed that Bible down, that page moved to Romans chapter 12. And I took that photograph. That was just really, I don't know if it was the spirit or what with that. And I wanted to show how beautiful this mountain was, but how it was rooted in racism. I wanted people to really think about what they were looking and what they are experienced because this mountain was, um, well, the land period in this country is Native Americans, but the Native Americans were here on this mountain and the Confederacy and the KKK actually took that over with. And I thought this was really kind of ironic, this image of a slave home where they actually stylized this and put a cotton bud on the desk where, I mean, on the table where, where they're eating. And this is the last thing that I'm gonna talk about. A lot of my work, um, I started in museums and galleries. And I feel that my work speaks to the masses of the people. So I, 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 I am, my work is in different spaces. It's, on, it's um, out, out in public space and on museums and galleries. This image that you see before you is an image by Richard Avedon, and he's holding his six-month-old daughter, Phyllis, and the SNCC students are behind him. I had the opportunity in 2019, 2000, yeah, 2019 to actually in public space, create a mural. But at the time, I didn't know who I was creating the mural for. It was part of the NFL. And I did, and if I would have known it at the time, I decided like, oh my God, they want me to do this. And I felt a certain kind of way because of what was going on with Colin Kaepernick and me 
photographing, you know, Black Lives Matter. And so I decided to go ahead and do it. So I was inspired by this image to create this image here of mothers of police brutality. The woman in the middle is um, Alton Sterling's, not Alton Sterling, Eric Garner's mother, I Can't Breathe, is in the middle. And Oscar Grant, Tamir Rice, and the rest of the mothers are from Atlanta, and I actually put Dr. Rosalind Pope, who authored the appeal, into the photograph. I brought them down. I had I rented out an Airbnb, and it was so emotional. I learned a lot from the mothers. I under I'm learning about the trauma from my ancestors up until now. It's this generational trauma. And these women who never thought that they would be activists are moving on to be activists and there's trauma within that. Some of these mothers are actually upset with the other mothers because they feel that their children are getting um their children are getting more attention there than than their children like what makes your son more important than mine do you see the trauma in that and so i created this mural and it's about 30 feet high and i have a what you call a guerrilla street curator and we don't we're not haphazardly placing these images anywhere the image that we curated is right around the corner from the jailhouse, the courthouse, and city count. In public spaces, when I do place my images in public spaces, this is what I do. And it was really kind of, it was hell getting this up, to be honest with you, but I got it up. And it's up to this day. And I'm really appreciative of the Richard Alva Foundation that allowed me to use Richard Avedon's photograph um, for this project. And with that, I'm through. All right. Um, I'm going to introduce Wendy Redstar. Raised on the Crow Reservation in Montana, Wendy Redstar's work is informed both by her cultural heritage and her engagement with many forms of creative expression including photography, sculpture, video, fiber arts, and performance. An avid researcher of archives and historical narratives, Red Star seeks to incorporate and recast her research, offering new and unexpected perspectives in work that is at once inquisitive, witty, and unsettling. Red Star holds a BFA from Montana State University Bozeman and an MFA in sculpture from UCLA. She lives and works in Portland, Oregon. The Nerman Museum has in its collection one set of Wendy, Wendy Red Star's Four Seasons photographs, which have been on display in multiple permanent collection exhibitions, including Contemporary American Indian Art, the Newman Museum Collection in 2014, and Monarchs, Brown and Native Contemporary Artists in the Path of the Butterfly in 2017. Additionally, the museum has on permanent display Red Star's Jingle Dress in one of the museum's collection focus areas that are installed across the JCCC campus. We are so excited, and I am personally very, very excited to introduce to everyone today, Wendy Redstar. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Sheila, that was uh, such an inspiring presentation. Um, and thank you for the important work that you do. I'm going to share with you um, one body of work that's fairly detailed. In 2014, I had a solo show in Portland, Oregon, where I'm based at the Portland Art Museum. And around that time, there was a lot of talk about cultural appropriation, especially regarding native imagery. And I started to think about that and what that meant to me and um, sort of, you know, personal connection to my community and, and um, have has some of our culture been appropriated? And immediately I thought of this chief of ours called Medicine Crow. And so when I left the reservation, two images of this chief named Medicine Crow sort of kept following me around. In a way, it was really comforting um, to run into his image. It was these two specific images. And for instance, this was just like a few years ago when I used to ride on planes. <laughs> Um, seems like centuries ago, but um, this was in a bookstore. And so it's one of 
one of the images of Medicine Crow. And then when I was in college, at, I mean, graduate school at UCLA, I used to go to Whole Foods just so I could get honest tea because they had an image of him. And I would uh, have him in my studio and sort of look over and feel comforted because at that point in Los Angeles, um, I didn't know any other crows or didn't make any connections with any crows that were there. Um, so yeah, so I started um, thinking about that and then really kind of thinking about that image and I googled his name and that's when I saw that a lot of other artists actually had made drawings and paintings of, of those images as well and I started thinking about these people and if they knew like his name or where he came from and then I started to ask myself well, well actually what happened like what happened that I take that photo and it took me on this amazing adventure what I learned was that photo was taken in 1880 um, by the chief uh, photographer of um, the Bureau of Ethnology. His name was Charles Milton Bell. And that these were standard delegation portraits that a lot of native uh, nations were traveling to Washington DC to meet with the president. And then they would often be photographed. And so I was just thinking, uh, wow, it wasn't just him, but it was five other chiefs who who went and the reason why they went to sit down and negotiate was because the US government was trying to put uh, the uh, railroad, uh, a train through a large track of our hunting territory. And so now I, now I understood that um, really the photo now that's sort of been following me around, when I look at it, it actually represents um, my community fighting for our culture and our land um, and our rights. So I started then to um, investigate. Now it wasn't just Medicine Crow, but these other chiefs that I wanted to learn about. Um, something amazing um, that I discovered was that Medicine Crow, when he returned from the trip uh, to Washington DC, they were there for two months, I believe. He actually drew a lot of it from memory. So these are some of the ledger drawings. So this is a drawing of the Capitol some of the different types of boats that he encountered. Um, three different types of trains. And then the other thing I was really interested in is really what they were trying to, to say through their clothing. And, um, and what they were trying to say was uh, how they became a chief or a bajecha, which translates literally to a good man. And so there are four things in order to become a crow chief, and they are to be the first in battle to touch an enemy warrior, snatching a weapon from an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, stealing a horse from with an enemy camp, and leading a successful war party. And so these four things had to be achieved and witnessed. And then they sort of broke down in the regalia as uh, like the ermine on old, this is old crow, his war shirt meant that he was able to capture a gun. If they're on his leggings, he was able to steal a horse. And then the various feathers represented certain coups, like uh, being the first to touch an enemy in battle or leading a successful war party. And so not only was it Medicine Crow that had a single delegation portrait, but all of the chiefs had single delegation portraits. So I started doing research on each of these chiefs um, through census records, um, through various archives, through uh, gossip, growing up and hearing about them, I would write things down. And a lot of these men um, have living descendants. So um, me even just going to school with somebody who is a descendant of one of these chiefs. So for instance, uh, um, Old Crow, he participated in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. And he was also, I think, the oldest uh, delegate member being 50 years old in this photo. And then if I could um, find their name written in Crow, I would include that. But the Crow language was never a written language historically. Um, it was turned into a written language, I believe, like 70s in the 70s. This is Pretty Eagle. Um, and in doing research about Pretty Eagle, uh, I learned that when he died, he was buried in the back of a wagon box. And then later on, his remains were stolen, along with several other Crow tribal members remains and then um, sold 
And then his remains ended up at, in the American Museum of Natural History for 72 years. And this is something that I never knew about Pretty Eagle. But there is this place on a reservation called Pretty Eagle Point that has this bronze teepee. And I knew about that, but it wasn't until I did the research that I learned that our tribe was able to get his remains back after being in that institution for 72 years. And that is where we buried his remains and created that memorial. So for me, all of those components started to click. This is Two Belly. Um, and Two Belly was a chief that I, I didn't even know about. And um, we have um, two, uh, two divisions within our tribe. There's the Mountain Crow and the River Crow. And so he's the only River Crow representative. Uh, the rest are Mountain Crow. And you can kind of see, even in the way that he dresses, his hairstyle's different. He's not wearing a war shirt, um, but he's wearing this really beautiful floral beaded jacket with otter trim. And the Portland Art Museum actually has a collection of um, native objects and they have crow objects. And we were able to find a very similar style jacket to what he was wearing. And this gives you a really good idea if there was color technology back then, how vibrant this portrait would be. So you can see two bellies standing up in the background. This is a um, Chief Plenty Crew who have a, I have a very close relationship with because where I grew up on the reservation was actually in the same district where Chief Plenty Crew used to live. And um, there is a park called Chief Plenty Crew State Park. So when he died, he allotted his land to uh, the state of Montana to turn into a park. And that, that park uh, has his log cabin. He's buried there, his wife and his um, adopted daughter's remains. There's a visitor center with artifacts. And I actually ran his estate for a year. And I was just sort of thinking about Sheila's last project. And this, this is sort of an interesting twist. Uh, when, when they were in Washington, DC, uh, because they were there for two months, they ended up taking them on various trips for entertainment. One of the trips that they took this delegation to was uh, a trip to Washington's estate, Mount Vernon. And Plenty Crew was so impressed with Mount Vernon <laughs> that it sort of stuck in his head. So when he came back um, and right before he died, that's what, that was his wish. He wanted to make a miniature Mount Vernon on our reservation. But in this uh, version, um, it would be an opportunity for other cultures to come to our reservation and learn and appreciate uh, Crow culture. So this is really kind of an interesting twist there. But he was actually the last chief of the Crow Nation. He died in the 30s. And then another surprise for me was that there were multiple photos of Medicine Crow. So those two that kept following me around, um, it was sort of shocking to see these other sort of um, these other portraits. One of the things I love pointing out is that Crow men love to wear hair extensions during this time. So you'll notice that I circled his hair extension and long hair equaled power. So the longer your hair, the more power you had. Another thing I like to point out is he's wearing these really great hair bows. And uh, this one is actually broken, should look like this. And then his hairstyle, you'll notice that all the mountain crow had this, um, like to wear this sort of similar hairstyle, which is called a pompadour, and they would stiffen it up with white clay. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm, I think, let me see, I'm gonna end there, um, but I just wanted to point out that the, the drawings that were, um, that document the delegation trip were actually, um, they actually happened because of this guy named Charles H. Barstow, who was a government agent on our reservation. And he had this practice when crows would come and do business, if they were waiting, uh, he would ask them to draw their accounts and experiences. So there's a really amazing story of these drawings actually uh, being given to like a grandchild of his and then abandoned and, um, uh, a storage unit and then somebody discovered them <laughs> and realized that they were very important and now they're at Montana State University in Bellings. So I'll go ahead and end there. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll start the Q&A. Um, so Ty and Tonya, if you want to get the ball rolling and look through the... Sure. I think there's only one question so far, but it takes a moment. Yeah, and we want to encourage anyone that has questions to please post them in the q and I'll do the first one, Tanya. This is for you, Wendy. Uh, so one of our uh, participants says that they've heard the rumor that natives did not want to be photographed because it had some sort of spiritual implications. Do you know um, how the crow felt about being photographed? Yeah, I think I think what they're, they're talking about is um, Crazy Horse, Lakota. I, I can't remember which band. I think he's Hunk Papa, which I always love saying Hunk Papa, <laughs> but Lakota. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there was sort of this legendary story about, uh, uh, crazy horse never wanting to be photographed mm -hmm. for that reason. But regarding my community, um, we actually were photographed a ton, um, mm -hmm. especially during that time period. And, um, I actually was, when I was doing research, uh, at the National Museum of the American Indian, I had the photo archivist, I asked her if she could actually help me uh, come up with a list of photographers during the turn of the century who were photographing my community. And I naively thought there would be maybe 20. Uh, she came back with, I think, 68 photographers, and I'm still adding to that. But I think uh, another kind of motivation for us is that we knew that our photos were highly desired, so uh, we would get paid. And, and so there was a big motivation, like, oh, if, you wanna, if you want us to sit for you, you'll have to pay. So I've read accounts even with Edward Curtis, who came and photographed our community, that uh, he had to pay up. <laughs> so no, I think we, um, I think uh, we both uh, cherished the photos, um, but also, I think we also had kind of an understanding of like the uses. Um, so Sheila, one of the questions here, it's, um, they say, I love your work, and they want to know if you currently are photographing using film or, di or um, digital, analog or digital. I actually came from um, analog, but I'm shooting digitally right now, and I'm actually going to be shooting with Polaroids, too. So it's going to be both. Okay, so this, oh, do you want me to do, an, do you want to just take turns, Tanya? Sure, yeah. Okay, <laughs> seems fair, right. Okay, so um, Wendy, this is one for you. Uh, so you know we have one of your Four Seasons pieces at the Nerman, and I've shown it to many students, and we have a lot of um, K through 12 students that come to the museum, you know, before and after COVID. Uh, so one of the participants is asking, what do you hope that school-age children learn from seeing photos, especially like the Four Seasons series? Mm. You know, just some background on the Four Seasons. I made that when I was in graduate school because I was really missing home. And the first thing that popped in my head of where I might be able to see something from home was I made this bet. If I go to the Natural History Museum, I bet I'll see some crow objects. And that, when you think about it, it's a really messed up statement. But sure enough, I, I ended up going there and I did see some crow moccasins there. But that was the first time though, actually, when I went to the Natural History Museum that I had a or when I went to just an institution in general, I came there with sort of a critical lens. And um, the experience I had was walking through a dinosaur exhibit first, and it was super dark. And then you went through that, and then you went into the native galleries. And it dawned on me that we were being set up as viewers. We were being set up to think that everything in this museum doesn't exist anymore, and it's extinct, including you know, the native, um, uh, the native people attached to the objects that they were displaying. And so basically, I just wanted to present that feeling that I had. So I created the four seasons, which are faux dioramas, um, with myself placed in them wearing my regalia. And what, what I hope is that it's a way to start a conversation. I think they're like beautiful, and they're really easy to kind of get sucked into. And you can start from there 
And, but once you start to kind of look into the images, you realize that it's, that it's fake. There's everything in there is fake, except mm. the person that's sitting there um, isn't. And so that's sort of the dialogue. It's just a starting point um, and a way to sort of critique the institution. I think it's interesting. Both of your works are doing such a great job at critiquing institutions. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, so there's a question here for both of you. Um, how do you, both artists, see the role of photography as art changing with the ubiquity of photography our children are growing up with now? How can we encourage critical thinking and appreciation of aesthetics? Wendy, I'll answer that first. Wendy, I love your presentation and I really want to talk to you afterwards, okay? Absolutely. Um, as an image maker for me, I think for me, it's a, it's a role for me to really start using my work engaging young people. And when I say young people, I'm talking about the age of six years old. Because at three, that's when they start forming of who they are and then they know who they are at the age of six. And I think the only way that we can really change that thought and that narrative is to really start at that age, you know, maybe creating curriculums um, for young people because um, these young babies that are growing up because they are so much smarter than I think I was coming up because of the technology and the knowledge that they have. And I think it really needs to start at that age because when we get older, it's hard for us to really change. And even young people, it's hard for us to change, you know? I agree with um, Sheila. And I actually, I think the, fu the future, gen the young generation is whip smart. <laughs> I have a 13 year old daughter and we actually had a collaborative practice when she was uh, seven and then she retired herself at 11. But just watching her and our collaborative work, she would, we do a lot of tours um, in museums and she would do tours for children. And they are able to grasp much more than what mm -hmm. we give them credit for. And so for that, I have a lot of hope for the, uh, the future generation. And they know exactly what they're doing with the technology. Like my right. daughter, <laughs> I right. feel like I sound like I'm super old or something. She makes me feel super old. But like with TikTok and Instagram and all of those things, they, they know what they're doing and they know what they're composing. And they, they also have an idea of a message that they, they want behind the image. So I, I do find it fascinating. But yeah, I do think starting young, building self-esteem and um, giving agency and, and ownership, I think are excellent ways and I do think that image making can do that. It's wonderful, thank you. Do you want me to go next, Tanya? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, this is kind of a two-part, Wendy. Uh, so all of the photographs of the Crow Chiefs that you show, that's all um, can you clarify for everyone that's all your work then that's on it that's labeling and doing all of the um, interpretation and then second what's the significance of what was on the jacket that you showed us like the floral patterning what was the significance of that yeah so yeah all the writing is mine um, based on just like different uh, research that I came across and then the floral um, the floral beaded jacket um, was actually something I've never seen a crow today wear. Uh, so when I originally saw it, I sort of laughed it off. <laughs> like, this isn't crow. And I think mean, that's what's so incredible, I think, with this project. It sort of really started, um, it humbled me greatly because I, I, I came in kind of thinking I knew a lot and then walked away realizing that I know nothing <laughs> and um, that there is, um, you know, just to be humble and open-minded and ready to shift at any moment because these are human beings, you know, and human beings are full of contradiction, but they're also full of surprises. And so his jacket is actually modeled after military jackets 
that were around that time um, that he might have seen at a local uh, trading post or whatever. So to think about the Apsalaga woman who put the together to make him look so smart was sort of modeled after sort of like this military jacket. And I love, I love the idea of subversiveness and um, um, sort of what, what they wear um, and w what they're saying. And basically they're wearing their best clothing to meet with the president, you know, who they had the same equal standing in their own community. So they wanted to, to show that to the president at the time. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to kind of combine a couple questions here. So for Sheila, um, someone is asking with the racist origin of film um, and how it was designed to shoot specifically white skin, how does that history come into play with your photography? And then also kind of, um, kind of broadening that question. Um, I'm sure research someone asked, I'm sure research informs your art, and could you give, um, maybe even both of you give, some specific examples of the research um, that, that went into the work? What I could say about um, the first part of the question is, for me, since I'm Black, I'm going to shoot <laughs> how we look in Black, unless I conceptually want to show something different on a concept. But as far as that, you know, that's there. It's, it's nothing that we can do about, but moving forward, that's where I think we all have to start learning, okay, about that. Because I don't know if a lot of people know about, because that was um, written in an article about the film and how it was based on, on race. Uh, races, um, you know, when it comes to Blacks. But me, as an image maker and being Black, um, I will shoot the color that I know that is true with that. And what was the latter question? How does research, and this is really for both of you, how does um, research kind of factor into the work conceptually? Um, for me, it, like, for example, the last body of work that I talked about, um, not the public space, but Invisible Empire, I wanted to do something on racism, but I didn't want to show bodies or people. And so conceptually, so when I started reading about the KKK in, in Stone Mountain, oh, it opened up a whole different world for me, you know, and I said, I can talk about this now without showing people based on my research. And I, how I found out about the Bible and what they were reading. And I took my father's Bible there and I laid it down. So it played a very important part for me. And also doing re finding uh, essays from W. E. Du Bois when he talked about the Invisible Empire. And that's what I named the body of work, Invisible Empire. Thank you. Wendy, do you want to add to that about the research that goes in, into your work? Yeah, I think um, I think I sort of stumbled upon it. <laughs> I I always like to say when I was growing up, I um, didn't I ended I I suffered from dyslexia. I didn't learn in a conventional mm -hmm. way, and I was actually held back in first grade, which seemed monumental to me when I was that little kid. Now, when I say it, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I it, but it was a big deal for me. Um, and so I think it wasn't until like I found art in undergrad, I actually switched majors that I realized that that's how I can speak. That's how I can articulate um, what I'm trying to say and how I can speak the loudest, but it has always been based off of sort of research um, is sort of the starting point, uh, looking into things. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say is that um, Growing up, I went to a school that was in a border town off the reservation, although it was sort of surrounded by the reservation, and it was very racist. There was uh, white rancher kids, mixed kids like myself, and, and crows. And if you were had any crow blood, you weren't really given a chance by the teachers. And so I just remember in history class, we never talked about crow history even though we were surrounded by it. We only talked about Native people around Thanksgiving. Mm. And I hated my history classes. 
so it's a trip now <laughs> that I feel like I, I'm obsessed with history. <laughs> and I was just thinking if only we would have had a teacher like that who would have showed me like this Crow delegation that we had these heroes, you know, that, um, that would have been so important to me. So I feel like doing the research now and then uncovering, I think Sheila said something earlier on in, in her presentation about like the history books, not, you right. know, the whole story. <laughs> and so for me, that's it. It's like, here's an opportunity now, like that I can add to these sort of these, these histories, you know, include, include um, the other parts of the story to these histories. Wendy, I hate my history too. I mean, as a small child being black and all they talked about is slaves and we were docile. How do you think a young kid feels about that? So I, I agree with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, as a historian, I always like any promotion of our discipline and subject matter. So <laughs> I appreciate the segue there. <laughs> um, so Wendy, this you you're, you kind of segued into this. Um, one of our uh, participants is a middle school art teacher and she is going to be introducing your last thanks to her students tomorrow. And she wondered if you could give some background on the backstory of making that photo and things maybe you'd be interested in having students learn about it. Yeah, again, so I produced that in um, graduate school. And uh, again, it stemmed from missing home. <laughs> I was always missing home in my community. And um, and yeah, kind of very simple and straightforward. It, it was around Thanksgiving. And how odd is it during this pandemic, you know, how we have to stay away from families and communities um, for safety. But um so yeah, I was thinking that was, again, the first time that I had critically thought about Thanksgiving. And so that was sort of the response to that. Mm -hmm. And I used Leonardo da Vinci's um, painting of the Last Supper and I play Jesus in it, but I'm in my regalia. And then there's the skeletons. Cause I was thinking about Thanksgiving as really, it's called the last thanks, you know, it was sort of the last feast for indigenous people before the colonizers totally took over. Um, so it's really kind of referencing, referencing that. That's great. Um, so there's another one here for Sheila. They say, Sheila, you seem so grounded and self-aware, Wendy too. Um, but has your work developed you, how has your work developed you as a person and have you always responded to current events? You know, since the pandemic, I've been, re that question, I've be been really reflecting on that because I think in the beginning, and I'm speaking for myself as a Black person, is that when I come from my mother's womb, we were born into a movement that we have to constantly deal with. And so it's like, it's on to the next. And what I'm trying to do now in my new body of work is to reimagine what, well, imagine what liberation looked like, because I believe that racism will always be here. But I think that I, as an artist, need to elevate and try to rethink and reimagine about how to talk about this in more of a liberating way. Okay, this is kind of a question that could go for both of you. So if Wendy, you want to start, uh, do you intend for your work to be received differently by your peers or people who share your identity uh, compared to people who don't identify or come from your communities? Wait, can you say that again? <laughs> so do you, do you intend or do you think that your work is interpreted differently by like other Crow people or other Indigenous people versus non-Natives? And then Sheila, the same for you. Do you intend for your work to be sort of experienced differently um, by Black Americans than it would be by, say, white Americans or non-Black Americans? I think as an Upsalaga person, of course, like another Upsalaga will, um, eat, like, like that whole question, do they know Medicine Crow's name? Well, every Upsalaga knows who Medicine Crow is. So there's just these things that uh, I don't have to be stated. So I'm very aware of that. 
I would not say other Indigenous people would know who uh, Medicine Crow is, just as I might not know other Indigenous leaders in their communities. Um, but no, my work is about humanity. That's all it's about, really. It's about having empathy and we're all humans at the end of the day. And so that's when I'm asking you to just have some empathy and relate on a human level. And if you can't do that, then I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so to me, um, beyond the Absalaga part, really it's about us all living on this planet together and being able to um, treat each other with respect. Yeah, I have nothing to say. Wendy is absolutely right. It's about, <laughs> our, it's about our humanity. And even though we may be differ, you know, she's Native American, I'm Black, we're all, we're talking about the same thing. And that's mm -hmm. what I was talking about earlier about how can, how can we get past this? <laughs> Yes, I do agree. Yeah. So this is another question um, that that um, has come up for both of you, and that's just, um, what are your what are your next projects? Where are you moving on to now? Do you want to go first, Cindy? Yeah. Sure. yeah I'm super, <laughs> super nervous, um, but kind of a nervous excitement. Um, I actually had a show scheduled in June that got postponed because of the pandemic. And so it's um, got some more time to work on it, but it's opening at the end of January at the Jocelyn Museum in Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm very excited about it because there was a photographer in 1898 named Frank Reinhardt who photographed what is known as the Indian Congress where over mm. 500 native people traveled to Omaha, Nebraska and for the Trans-Mississippi Exposition. So in a way, it was a, a way for Omaha to show that they were an industrious city and it was sort of based off of the World's Fair. And in that, they knew that they would get more viewers or attract tourists if they had an Indian village. So they created this Indian Congress. But on the flip side of that, I don't think they realized that when those native communities came together, that there was opportunity for native people to discuss how the US government was treating them. So there were these sort of things that they were not sort of uh, anticipating. Mm -hmm. But the incredible thing that came out of that were these beautiful photographs of each of these delegations. Um, oh, I think it was, I'm going to misquote how many tribes were actually there, but close to 500 individual Native people were there, in, including some of my own community. And then um, after that, the photographer actually ended up traveling to my reservation and photographing about a mile away from where I grew up. So I could actually physically stand there and see where he photographed my community. And they're, they're so strikingly different, this sort of fake setup fair to then actually being on Upsalaga grounds. Um, so in that way, we're recreating the Indian Congress. I'm busily cutting out 500 portraits <laughs> <laughs> and I'm putting all of them up. Uh, and the wonderful thing about this, um, these images is actually the photographer wrote each of their names down and uh, who their uh, tribal affiliation was, which mm -hmm. is rare. Usually a, a lot of times they didn't keep that sort of record keeping. So yeah, so you'll walk in and you'll be in the Indian Congress and you'll be, be able to see those 500 cut out portraits and you can walk amongst the Indian Congress. Cause that's what I wanted. I wanted to feel that because I was thinking how phenomenal that would be to be around that many indigenous folks. Um, for me, I received a commission from the High Museum um, called Picturing the South. So I am going to challenge myself with landscapes instead of people. And that's going to be very hard for me, but it's going to be a good challenge because I want to talk about how the land in relationship to Black bodies and Native Americans, because it's going back, it was always about the land. So I'm excited to do that. And it'll be coming out next year. I have a year to produce it. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, there's 
lots and lots of people saying thank you. This is quite inspiring from both of you. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you, you so for much. joining us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you for um, having an open mind to listen. <laughs>